This is an episode of Reasonably Sound Classic. For the first 30-some episodes, this podcast was distributed by Infinite Guest, American Public Media's podcast network. Thus, it benefited from blanket broadcast licenses held with every music publisher. After going independent, pretty much all intro, outro, and interstitial music had to be removed. The intro and outro music you're going to hear is an in-progress version of Reasonably Sound's theme, written by Will Stratton. The awkward silences are where act break music used to be, so if you could just imagine like Queen or The Misfits or Kate Bush along the way, that would be great. If you want to support Reasonably Sound in the hopes that maybe one day I'll be able to afford some blanket licenses of my own, you can check out the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound. Okay, on with the show. Okay, so first things first, I hope everyone had a great holiday season, or festive period, as I saw it written on a large display on the London Underground as I was wandering around there with my girlfriend Molly. She's from the UK, and since we did Christmas with my family last year, we did it with her family around London this year. It was tons of fun, and I'm not just saying that because of the likelihood there listening. It was great. We did what I would describe, though people who are from there would probably cringe at hearing it described as the whole London thing. Tate Modern, Oxford, Piccadilly, though my mild agoraphobia did keep us from spending too much time in the busiest parts. If you're from New York City, just imagine Broadway in Soho on a Saturday afternoon times 25. It was almost actually and literally unbelievable how crowded it was. We saw some theater. I managed to get some record shopping in. I grabbed Elliot Sharp's Tessellation Row, to which I am listening as I write this. We drank many beers at all kinds of pubs, and I said several times, you know, I would move to England just for the beer. And I stand by it, though. I would. Is there a beer drinking visa? There should be. We also, as you tend to do when you're traveling around and in mixed company, talked about the differences between whatever cultures were represented by those sitting at the table. Frequently, if not usually, I was the only American. I answered some questions about gun laws, taxes, drinking age, you know, America stuff. Mostly, though, I asked questions. And what I asked about the most, because it is a thing I find endlessly fascinating and a thing that Britons always seem inclined to discuss at length, was the UK's vast array of accents, which is what we're going to be talking about for the next however many minutes your audio player of choice says are remaining. Accents. English and American accents specifically. A little history, how both, as we know them, came to exist, how they work, and how, at least generally, they differ from one another. And let this serve as fair warning, there will probably be at least one really bad impression. The first thing we'll get out of the way is slang. Slang isn't really related to accents, at least not directly. Slang isn't about sound, and accents are. Slang is what words people use, not how they pronounce those words. Except, I guess, for situations where slang might develop because of a frequent and characteristic mispronunciation, but already we're getting too far off of the path I intend to beat. But still, man, from my perspective, at least, British slang is top-notch. And it's so much fun, so we'll digress for just a moment, maybe three moments, and provide you with some new, fun words to liven up your vocabulary. First, while playing the card game Hanabi, which is great, and if you don't play it, highly recommended, with Molly and her friend Ed, upon botching some particularly important maneuver, Molly admitted to having completely miffed it 
miffed, sort of like if you missed something but replaced the S's with F's. I'm not really sure. I mean, I'm aware of the American usage. To be miffed is to be pissed off. Maybe it's like when you miff something, it causes you to become miffed? Or maybe it's like when you swing a baseball bat really hard at an incoming pitch and you just miss completely. My father used to call that a whiff after the sound it made, and ostensibly also after the wiffle ball brand of bat and ball. Maybe a miff is like a whiff after which you get miffed? Clearly, there are some questions left unanswered here. Second, just before heading to the UK, I bought a new phone. I thought it might be fun to get a really tacky case for it at some terrible tourist trinket shop or some local gift store, and after describing exactly the kind of kitschy, gaudy thing that I was going for, I was informed I was looking for something completely naff. N. A. Two Fs. Naff. Naff, I later learned, means something which is mundanely tacky, lacking style, displaying bad taste, etc., etc. Basically, just uncool. But as tends to be the case with slang, it has an entire rainbow of additional uses. However you might use any other four-letter word, naff can be deployed similarly. Naff off, a complete naff, naff this, and so on and so forth. Upon some digging, though, me and Molly also learned that it might, it seems like some folks aren't 100% on board with this origin story, have originated in English gay culture as an acronym, N-A-F, one F, meaning not available to fuck. Suddenly, my new completely naff phone case, which is neon pink, by the way, takes on a completely different meaning. And finally, in our list of slang, if someone tells you that Bob's your uncle, it means that you have succeeded or achieved some desired result. It has nothing to do with your uncle, whatever his name may be. Okay, slang digression over. Let's talk for serious now about the English accent. The first thing I became really curious about during my 10 days hanging out with so many people who speak so differently from me was, why? Why do they speak differently? I mean, well, sure, people in different places speak differently. New Yorkers speak differently from Bostonians who speak differently from Mainers. And this isn't new information. What I mean is why, as categories of accent with many subcategories, is the American accent so different from the British one? America was a British colony is a thing I probably don't need to declare for the benefit of anyone listening to this podcast. It was settled by lots of British folks is an obvious follow-up statement to the previous unnecessary declaration. In theory, they all came over here with English accents. Where did the American accent come from? When those troublemakers threw tea into the Boston Harbor, did they also send out a memo saying, hey, listen, so we've all been thinking, and maybe also, in addition to the tea thing and whatever else, just to really stick it to the king here, we should also maybe start talking different, yeah? So, effective immediately, we're going to start pronouncing our R's, except for you, Boston, and also move some of those vowels further into the back of our mouths. And don't round everything out so much. Has everyone got that? Great. As it turns out, and you might want to sit down for this one, we do still have an English accent. Well, kinda. Mutated and changed and influenced by an increasingly global culture over the last almost 250 years, but when America was newly minted as such, its residents spoke with an accent resembling the citizens of its former empire and, at least as far as I've understood this mountain of linguistics literature that I've been pouring through, which is to say I am definitely not a linguist, the difference between the American accent and the English accent is accounted for more by changes made to speech in the UK than in the States. But before we talk about how and why that worked out the way it did, I think it might be instructive to talk for a few minutes about where the English accent, both of them, came from. 
and to also explain how words can look the same or similar on paper, but sound so different when different groups of people say them. Because weirdly, those two things are sort of related. So, the printing press, the more modern, movable type style printing press, was invented in the mid-15th century. Along with all of the amazing things we associate with its creation and widespread use, the maintenance and sharing of knowledge, the spread of artistic, political, and social ideas, another far less often celebrated thing happened. Spelling was standardized. Before the printing press, spelling was a wild, freewheeling pursuit based on general concepts of letter sounds. Whoever was writing spelled their words however they felt best approximated the sound they heard when they, and people around them, spoke. But with the printing press, it became possible and likely that those printed texts would travel to other people, people not around them, people who didn't sound like them when they spoke. Imagine, for instance, it's way back when, and some works penned by a Scotsman make their way, by happenstance, to southern England, a place they were never intended to arrive. The text might not be indecipherable, but it almost certainly would not have used the same spelling conventions, since, amongst other things, the dialects of each area would have been different. With the invention of the printing press, as many copies of certain sets of texts were able to travel, so too did norms about letters, the sounds they were understood to represent, and by extension, the ways they could be used to spell spoken words. Basically, spelling became standardized across the entire language and not within spoken dialects. Now, fate, being the cruel high tyra she is, at about the same time all of this was happening, the printing press, the spreading of knowledge, the standardization of English spelling, another important and totally bizarre linguistic phenomenon was taking place, and would continue to take place over the next 300 years. It was something called the Great Vowel Shift. Starting at about a hundred years before the invention of the printing press, about the mid-14th century, and concluding around the early 18th century, the Great Vowel Shift was a period over which the sounds of each vowel in the English language, well, shifted, like their actual spoken sound changed. For example, someone speaking Middle English might say, mate for the modern English meat, spelled M-E-E-T, or boat for the modern English boot, B-O-O-T. Over the 300-plus year period of the GVS, long English vowels raised, meaning the height of one's tongue when speaking actually raised, fronted, meaning the tongue moves forward, rounded, which I think is pretty self-explanatory, and diphthongized, meaning changed from a solid vowel sound like E to a combination of two sounds like I. This was the case with mice, for instance. Today, the I in mice is a diphthong, producing the sound I. Mice. Mice. A Middle English speaker would have said meese, like a Looney Tunes character might. By around 1700, most of the great vowel shifts raising, fronting, rounding, and diphthongizing concluded. There were, and still are, vowel shifts taking place, but their greatness is nothing compared to the change that occurred over those three centuries. With the shifting complete, English transitions from Middle to Modern English, which forms the basis of what will eventually split to become English and American accents. 
But oh, right, the printing press. I bring that up because as the printing press was helping to standardize English spelling, the great vowel shift was changing how all of those words sound. So the written word was set in uh, parchment, I guess, but its sound was still in flux. This is the reason the English language has so many weird spelling exceptions, where the same written thing can sound different, or differently written things sound the same, especially when it comes to vowels. It's why words with EAs in the middle, like mean and steak or bear, look similar, but sound different. Mean changed during the great vowel shift. Steak and bear didn't. Oh, and also, just so it's been said, none of this accounts for the spelling differences between English and American text, like color and color, or theater versus theatre. It's a whole other thing involving the famous English lexicographer Samuel Johnson and the proudly American Noah Webster, as in Webster's Dictionary, and his hatred of the French. No, seriously, Noah Webster's dislike of French had a lasting impact on American spelling. It's not sound related, so I'm not going to get into it here, but I'll put some links on infiniteguest.com slash reasonably hyphen sound if you're curious. So, but anyway, up to this point, we've been talking mostly about vowels. They're important, but I mean, that's like all meat and no potatoes, right? We don't have time, not by a long shot, to talk about all the sounds for every letter in the very many places where English is the native tongue, but there is one consonant which plays a particularly important part in the whole story. That consonant is R, and it is the source of the central difference between English and American accents. In the States, most of us pronounce our R's. There are a few notable geographical exceptions, one of them being my home city, go Red Sox, but mostly, if there is a letter R, Americans will make an R sound. In the language biz, they say that this makes our language rhotic. R-H-O-T-I-C, rhotic. By comparison, most of England, so excluding other parts of the UK like Scotland and Ireland, is non-rhotic. R's are not pronounced unless, generally, they come directly before a vowel. So, while someone from Cincinnati and someone from Manchester might both say very or rope, the former would say part and cardboard, while the latter would say pot or cardboard. I told you there would be very bad impressions. Anyways, that's roticity and non-roticity, respectively. Now, here's what's crazy. The non-roticity of English spoken by people in England is a relatively new thing. I find this especially mind-blowing because the lack of hard R sounds is what I most directly associate with the English accent, but it really wasn't until the early 19th century that that type of speech we associate with England lost its R's. How did all the R's flee? Where did they go? Well, I'm glad you asked. As late as the mid-1600s, most of England was still pronouncing its R's in some form or another, though over the next hundred years or so, its sound would become weaker and weaker. Not long after the great vowel shift had run its course at about the end of the 18th century, non-roticity started around London and, radiating outward from there, eventually enveloped most of the country's parts. Or, um, pots. I guess. The dropping of R's picked up speed after it became a sign of status. Non-roticity became associated with the upper classes of London society. It was, as Ellie van Gelderen calls it in A History of the English Language, a, quote, prestige variant. By 1770, van Gelderen writes, R has disappeared after vowels in Southern English, but not in other areas. 
other areas like Scotland and Ireland, which still pronounce many of their R's, and the United States, which, as it turns out, didn't draft a memo, but rather didn't receive one. Van Gelderen again writes that, quote, R has a strong presence in the American colonies. Initially, the R-less variant is less formal and is criticized on both sides of the ocean, but later it gains prominence in standard British and certain varieties of American English. It's probably worth noting that the locations in the United States with the most non-rhotic speakers, Boston, New York City, Charleston, are port cities which were more likely to do business with or become home to the English. It was non-roticity and its reaching something of a critical saturation in England that signaled the start of what we'd currently identify as the general English accent a type of speech known as received pronunciation, or RP, so-called because it was taught in schools as the correct or accepted pronunciation. In the way one receives their culture and ideology, so too did one, in this case at least, receive RP. RP is something of a standard English accent, comparable to the United States' non-regional-sounding Midwestern dialects sometimes called general American, most commonly understood as the ideal for national newscasters, except for some people who hear it, RP does have a strong and meaningful regional association, specifically with the southeast of England. And relatedly, that's not the only association it has. Since only about 3% of the English population are native RP speakers, but the accent has historically been heard disproportionately coming out of the mouths of politicians, members of the media, and those in positions of power, it's become associated with flaunted privilege, much of which is localized around London in the southeast of England. In comparison, I think most Americans associate the general American accent with... I don't know, wholesomeness? Maybe insipidness, if we're being really uncharitable? Cornfields, if I'm really reaching. It's important to remember, though, that we've really just scratched the surface. RP might be the basis, the standard English accent, but it is by no means the only or most interesting. For future episodes of Reasonably Sound, maybe a taxonomy of American and English accents. Ideally with native speakers, I think. I gotta write that down. One of the reasons I really enjoy talking to English folks about accents, about their accents, is the fact that each one comes with a story, and more often than not, a character. Which, yeah, is true of the States as well. There's the stereotypical Bostonian and Californian and Southerner and Midwesterner, but in England, and I don't know, maybe it only feels this way because I am an outsider, it feels like the accent resolution is so much higher and so much better understood. It feels like there are more accents per square mile, and like everyone has taken a class at some point on how to do a perfect and convincing Liverpool accent for when the American bloke starts asking about how they talk in that part of the country. My name is Mike Rugnetta, and this podcast has been Reasonably Sound. You can find Reasonably Sound on Instagram and Twitter at ReasonablySND. You can find me on all the internet things at Mike Rugnetta. <laughs>